Everyone has questions. Why am I here? Where will I go when I die? Is there really truth? But not everyone has biblical answers. Welcome to The Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study the Bible to draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is Pastor Tom Brock. Welcome to the Pastor's Study. Today I want to tell you the inspiring story of Hans Egeta and the conversion of Greenland back in the 1600s. I've got a great book to recommend. It's called From Jerusalem to Erie and Gyra. It's, it's a history of Christian missions and it'll just bless you to read story after story of these wonderful missionaries and what they've done in the last 2,000 years. So. Here's what I'll do today. I want to tell you the story of Hans Egeda, the conversion of Greenland, and then after the end of the story, it'll take a while, I want to draw lessons from his life for our life. So let's pray first. Father, we do pray that even people watching this show would be called into mission work, that whether they're to stay home and be a missionary at their job or in their family, or whether you're calling them to Greenland or Africa, Lord, we would pray that many, many missionaries would go forth and preach your gospel. And Lord, show us in this hour how we are to help and support. In Jesus' name, amen. Hans Egeda was born in Norway in 1686. He grew up in a devout Lutheran home. At age 21, he became a pastor and started 10 stormy years because he and another pastor had a difficult relationship because of some money issues. He married a woman named Gertrude who was 13 years older than himself. Gertrude's brother was a whaler and he would tell Hans stories of how now Greenland is inhabited by heathen. Now Hans grew up learning how in 1000 AD, Leif Erikson took the Gospels from Scandinavia and converted people in Greenland. But that was 1000 AD. This is now 1600s and the question is, are there any Christians left in Greenland? People didn't know. Hans had to know. He started having a, a desire to go to Greenland. So Hans goes down to Copenhagen, Denmark, to talk to King Frederick, and he lays before King Frederick the, quote, plan for the conversion and enlightenment of the Greenlanders. Well, Hans's proposal drew opposition from his own family. His mother-in-law was outraged to think that her daughter and grandchildren now would be going to Greenland. In fact, Gertrude herself hinted that she regrets ever marrying this man. But then Hans and Gertrude pray about it, and she catches the zeal too, and she became his strongest supporter. In fact, um, after her attitude changed, he wrote this, Gertrude, a frail woman, has shown greater faith and manliness than I in carrying out this plan. So they head out for Greenland from Norway. Uh, Hans falls overboard on the trip and is barely rescued in time, but some fisherman rescues him. Instead of being discouraged, Hans saw that as a sign from God, I'm really supposed to go to Greenland. On board ship were only 46 people, Hans and his family, and then some commercial men that the king of uh, Denmark had sent along for commercial purposes. These men would become the thorn in Hans's side. After much peril, the ship lands in Greenland. The first thing Hans does is builds a shelter for him and his family. Then he settled down to the very unromantic work of being a missionary. The natives, these Eskimos who thronged around them once they arrived, spoke a, a, a dialect that was, had no connection to any uh, European language, so it was very difficult. However, Hans's sons, uh, Paul and Nels, quickly picked up the Eskimo language and they taught their father uh, the, the language. Um, Hans soon discovers that Christianity had died out completely in Greenland 
there were no Christians left. So uh, uh, Hans starts the work. Now, the Agatas were kind of refined people, and he, Hans would visit these Eskimos. They lived in huts inhabited by multiple families. The rotted fish smell stunk as he would visit, but he knew he had to visit the homes, especially during the long winter months, if he was to convert these people. Well, the conversion went very slowly because Hans was a rather strict Lutheran, and he insisted that they get rid of all their pagan ways before he would baptize them. They had to get rid of their magic charms. They had to get rid of their drum dances. Things went very slowly. Hans, even though now, started to win the hearts of the Eskimos by singing to them. He would sing to them, and that that drew them closer to him. Even the Angakoks, those were the uh, the superstitious kind of the wise men or the, um, what do we call them, the sorcerers of the village, they resisted Hans the most. Even they start to get won over. Nevertheless, it was slow, slow going. And Hans, though, because their children had not accepted their parents' practice, he started to baptize with their ch parents' permission. He starts to baptize the children, the Eskimo children. But perhaps the greatest obstacle that Hans faced was these commercial men that came with him from Europe. They led evil lives and they were a very bad advertisement for the Christian faith. Nevertheless, Hans and his family were true believers and they plunged on. In 1733, another set of problems arrived when the Moravian missionaries from Europe came to Greenland. Now, uh, the Moravians were committed Christian people, uh, but they thought Hans was more concerned with Lutheran doctrine than with saving people's souls. On the other hand, Hans Egeda looked at them and thought they were just into emotional religion and didn't care about saving people from superstition, so there was some friction. Uh, Nevertheless, they worked side by side. Hans and Gertrude, when the Moravians got the scurvy, they nursed them back to help, health, and, and Gertrude was greatly loved by the Moravians. One observer, though, wrote this, the Greenlanders are apt to doubt the whole of Christian faith and say, how can it be the truth if you, the Moravians and Hans, are quarreling about it yourselves? Well, finally, in a strange way, there was a breakthrough. The Eskimos got smallpox, and now the softer side of Hans came forth. He would visit them. He would bring uh, sick people. Gertrude would bring them into their home. They would nurse the sick. Musk Eskimos would come from many miles around to get the, the treatment from the Agatis. Nevertheless, though, 3,000 Eskimos died. But after the plague had passed, Hans noticed a much greater openness to the Christian gospel from the Eskimos. One dying Eskimo said this, You have been more kind to us than we have been to one another. You have fed us when we were famished. You buried our dead. And in particular, you told us of God and how to become blessed in the next life. And at the same time as this was happening, revival broke out among the Moravian missionaries and hundreds of, mission, of, of Eskimos came to Christ. Hans got jealous and he claimed, quote, you are reaping where I have sowed. <laughs> um, well, in 1736, after a long illness, Gertrude dies and broken in soul and, and spirit at about age, what, 76 or so, Hans decides to go back to uh, Scandinavia but he leaves his sons in Greenland to carry on his work. When, when uh, Hans retired back to, the, uh, to Europe, he didn't retire. He founded a school to train more missionaries to go back to Greenland. And at age 72 it was when he died. In 1758, Hans Egeta died. Today, Lutheranism is the official religion of Greenland and something like 98% of Greenlanders consider themselves Lutheran. That is the story of Hans Egeda. Let me share with you some lessons for our life from his. 
Lesson number one. God uses the imperfect for his perfect work. Hans had kind of a stubborn personality. He got jealous. He was kind of rigid. God used him anyway. <laughs> and dear friend, don't let the fact that you have personality flaws keep you from serving the Lord. God uses imperfect people to do his perfect work. I love this old hymn that goes like this. Listen to the words. Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness God requires is to feel your need of him. Come ye wounded, weak and weary, lost and hurt now by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. In other words, don't wait till you got it all together to serve the Lord because you'll never have it all together. Second lesson I learned from Hans Egeda, Christianity can die out and be resurrected. Christianity came to Greenland in 1000 AD. By 1600, it had died out, but it got resurrected. You know, sadly, Christianity is somewhat dying out in America, but it's really dying out in Europe. Well, God can bring it back. This has happened in, in Russia. You know, Russia for 80 years was under communist atheism. I was able to stand in a Russian high school, a public high school, and hand out Bibles. Christianity is making a bit of a comeback now in Russia. It can happen. Next lesson I get from Hans Egeda, follow God's call regardless of your family. If Hans had listened to his mother-in-law, maybe Greenland would never have been evangelized. Many years ago when I said to my mom, Mom, I think I'm going to be a pastor. Her response was, sure you don't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. But you know what? She wasn't thrilled about it. I know I'm, I'm supposed to be a pastor. So you follow God's call even if your family opposes. Next lesson I get from Hans Egeda, never underestimate the power of music. Music is what won over the Eskimos. You know, sadly, the opposite is true. In our nation, evil music, you know, rap music and rock music with the F word, that kind of music is winning over people in the wrong direction. But wonderful music can win people to Christ. You know, you know I thought of this. If I should ever, God forbid, leave the Christian faith, you know one of the things I'd really miss? Christian music. <laughs> the beautiful old hymns. Christian contemporary music. I mean, I would miss that if I didn't have the church. Next lesson from Hans Egeda, children are the easiest to convert. You know, they, they, there was a survey and something like 85% of people who are converted to Christ say it happened before 18 years of age. Did you hear that? 85% of people say, I became a Christian before age 18. That's why you're smart if your church budget has a lot of money going to Sunday school, toward youth programs, hiring a youth director, because that's when most people come to know Christ. Next lesson from Hans Egeda. For the sake of the gospel, put aside differences. Hans and the Moravians had differences. They put them aside for the sake of the gospel. Here's a, a friend that said to me, well, this, this man I know, he's starting a new Bible study. And I think there were people of various Christian backgrounds that are going to go to the Bible study. So he goes to the first session of the Bible study. And this man says, you know, Pastor Tom, when the Bible study leader found out I'm a Lutheran, he said, oh, you believe in infant baptism and just railed on me that was the first and last meeting of that Bible study. <laughs> you know, Christians, we live in a day and age when America is morally falling apart. We need to agree to disagree on some of the uh, issues, but let's hold our hands and bring Christ back to our American culture. Next lesson from Hans Egeda. God often uses a tragedy as a door to the gospel. It was smallpox 
that got the Eskimos to be open to receiving Christ. You know, maybe you watching this TV show, maybe the reason you're a Christian right now is because some tragedy struck you, and that's when you came to know Christ. There's a saying. Some people look up only when they're lying on their backs. And next lesson from Hans Egede. See that your work is carried on. Hans knew he was going to die, so he built Christianity into his sons, and his sons carried on the work in Greenland after Hans had to return home. You know, I hope you're doing that. You know, Mom and Dad, I hope your main desire for Jimmy is not that he plays baseball, and that your main desire for Susie is not that she plays piano. I hope you are building Christianity into your children so that when you leave this earth, somebody's going to carry on the work of the Christian gospel. And the last lesson, maybe the main lesson I learned from Hans Egede is this. Never give up. <laughs> Hans and Gertrude had trial after trial after trial. They never gave up. And I want to say this to you, especially if you're retired, never give up. You know what happened when Hans retired? He goes back to, uh, to Scandinavia. He didn't retire. He used that retirement time to train other people as missionaries to go back overseas to Greenland. So if you're retired... And if you can barely get out of bed, there's a reason you're on earth. Maybe you're supposed to become a prayer warrior. Maybe you're supposed to pray for the missionaries. But uh, never give up, no matter what stage of life. You remember the story that Winston Churchill, years ago, comes over to America to give the college commencement address? And here's all these people in their graduation gowns. Churchill gets in front of the crowd and says, never give up. Never give up, never give up, never give up, never give up. And he sat down. That was his message. <laughs> I, I like this message, too, the quote from, from uh, Winston Churchill. Do you have enemies? Good. That means that somewhere you stood up for something. <laughs> Here is what I learned from Hans Egede. Number one, God uses imperfect people for his perfect work. Number two, Christianity can die out, but it can be resurrected. Number three, follow God's call even if your family resists. Number four, never underestimate the power of music. Number five, children are the easiest to convert. Number six, for the sake of the gospel, put aside differences. Number seven, God often uses tragedy to open the door for people to Christ. Number uh, eight, uh, see that your work is carried on. And then Christian, never quit. Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor study where we now ask Pastor Brock to share with us not only his knowledge of scripture but his insights to answer questions we have regarding the Bible, our Lord, and our everyday walk with him. If you have a question that you'd like Pastor Brock to ans answer, feel free to send it to our website which you'll see on the screen right now and we'll take and answer that question at a later date. Pastor Brock, what are some, where are some of the places that Christianity is dying out? Mm -hmm. Europe, uh, somewhat America, uh, Canada, um, Australia. Those are some of the places that are losing the faith and people are stopping. Uh, one in ten go to church in England. One in ten. So that's where it's dying. All right, where is it flourishing? Uh, parts of Asia. Africa is set to become more of a Christian continent than Northern America now. I mean, I don't know if they've passed us by, but they're getting there. So Africa, even though there's lots of Muslims in Africa, parts of Asia are having revival. Uh, Africa, so those are some of the bright spots. Okay, so there still is hope then? There is hope. Okay. <laughs> it can what be resurrected. Okay. What do you think of contemporary Christian music? It seems like lately, no matter what church you go into, the old hymns are gone, yeah. and there's all the contemporary music. Well, Jackie, you remember way back when I came to your church. Ba Jackie's been at the same church since she was baptized. So you've been at the same church your whole life. We won't tell you how many years that is. But um, when I came to your church to be pastor way back in 1981, I don't know if you remember this. There was World War III over bringing contemporary Christian music into this hymn-singing Lutheran church. And Jackie, it got just stupid and ugly. 
And I think to myself, I love the old hymns, Jackie. I would, it would be sad for me if we didn't sing the old hymns in church. But I love contemporary Christian music. Where does it say in the Bible you can't have both? So I think contemporary Christian music is fine. I, too, don't like it much when they ditch all the hymns. I don't like that. But I love the contemporary Christian music. Why not have both? Yeah. Okay. I think it's just sometimes your diehard people who had the hymns, and that was all mm -hmm. before contemporary yeah. music came about. Yeah. It's but you, well, you know, I'll tell you this. What's wonderful about the old hymns is they're very theological. They're deep. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, I, I, nothing's wrong with emotional uh, religion either, Jackie. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that says this, a hymn has to be 500 years old and written by Luther before you can sing it. <laughs> you mentioned about the children mm -hmm. are easier to convert. Why? Why is that, do you think? You know, I think they're not as steeped in unbelief as you... You know, Jackie, I, I used to, many years ago, kind of have a theory that if you know you're dying, you're going to convert to Christ. Well, early on in my ministry, I learned that's not the truth. You know, I visited this old man dying of lung cancer. I shared the gospel with him. He just said, no, because his heart was so hard. Your heart can get so hard that you don't accept Christ. That's why children tend to be easier to convert. Don't you think, too, that if you start with a child when they're young, even if they don't understand it, mm -hmm. they've got it to fall back on right. is Train important? Up a, this is Proverbs. Train up a child in the way he should grow, go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That doesn't mean there might be some wandering in between, <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah. Okay, so I guess what are some of the missions that you believe in mm -hmm. that we should be looking at? I'll just throw out some that I love. Uh, go to persecution.org. It's a group called International Christians Concerned. They help persecuted Christians around the world that are being beheaded, and, you know, and they also help start churches and, and or do, they supply funds to underground pastors. So it's called persecution.org. I like uh, uh, the Samaritan's Purse run by Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham. They, they're very careful on how they use money. So I like a Campus Crusade for Christ. There's lots of good missionaries out there. Again, Jackie, I'll say it. I said on a previous show. When some preacher is on TV telling you to send him money for miracle spring water and you'll be healed of your lumbago, do not send money to those people. It makes me angry to see those people hawking that. And you want to send money to people. I'll say it again. I've said it before. The ECFA, Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability, and you better believe those people are not part of that because those people are held accountable if you join that group. Okay, we're, we've <coughs> talked about how important it is to have missionaries. How does a person know if God wants them to become a missionary? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you just got to pray, and then you wait upon the Lord, and if you just, just pray. I mean, I, Jackie, I, I, I prayed for three years, was it? About two or three years. For two or three years there, I didn't know what I was supposed to do with my life. And then finally God made it clear, and I won't go into it, how I'm supposed to be a preacher. And so what, you, you pray, and you wait on the Lord, and then he will show you what to do. Okay. Does a person have to go overseas to be a missionary? No. Though? I not mean, in this day and age. Not in this day and age when, when a lot of the people next door to me are Muslims. I mean, I've got Muslim neighbors. You don't have to go overseas. You've got people right at your workplace that don't believe in Christ. Uh, you, you can do it at your job. Yeah. Okay. I once heard a pastor say that God never sends disease and that the devil does that. Yeah. Is that true? I saw, uh, I won't say who he was, one of these big TV preachers that has you send in money to get the miracle water. And he said, God never sends disease or, or that kind of thing. The devil does that. And I'm thinking, what Bible does he read? R Exodus chapter 4, God says to Moses, who makes man deaf, dumb, seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Sometimes the Lord blinds people. You've got that in the book of Acts where Elymas the musician is blinded by the Lord. you got 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where the Corinthians are getting drunk on Holy Communion. And Paul says, that's why you're sick and dying. It was the Lord that was doing that. Who hit Pharaoh with the plagues? It wasn't the devil. It was the Lord that did that. So, uh, yes, sometimes the devil, the, uh, the devil can have a hand in it, but ultimately God controls everything. Okay, so if a person is sick, is God punishing that person? Uh, you know, it, it, there's two answers to that. 
the people we just mentioned in, in uh, Corinth that were getting drunk on communion? I think the answer to that is yes. <laughs> but then you've got in, Act, in John chapter 9, the disciples came up and said, Jesus, who, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, nobody sinned. This is for the glory of God, and he heals the man. So, so Jackie, if you get drunk tonight and you have a rip-roaring hangover tomorrow, there's a connection between your sin and sickness. But on the other hand, sometimes this is just part of living in a fallen world, and you get sick, and it's not that God's punishing you for anything. Why is our world falling, though? I mean, what have we done wrong? Hmm. You know, Jesus said, to whom much is given, much shall be required. America has been given so much. Jackie, we're about the wealthiest nation on earth. We were about the most Christian nation on earth. And as now we have gay marriage, we have abortion on demand, we have, uh, we're, we're thumbing our nose at God, and that's what's gone wrong. We're kicking God out of our culture. And when you do that, you get what you get. Do you think there's a possibility of turning it back? You know, I hope. We just heard how Greenland, Greenland got the gospel in 1000 AD, had it for a, quite a while, then totally lost it by the 1600s. America's losing it. Uh, is, Mer is America going to repent and come back? I hope so, but I don't see much sign of that. How do you undo gay marriage now? How do you undo all the abortion clinics? You know, God can do anything, but it doesn't look good to me. Pastor Brucker, do you have any good Bible verses that would encourage people to never quit mm -hmm. that you'd yep. suggest? Yep. What is it? Is this Isaiah 42? It's a song. And I, I drive this to places where I'm going to have a scary meeting or I have to confront somebody. I hate confronting people. It goes like this. Do not fear, for I am with you. Be not anxious, for I am your God. Surely I will help you. Surely I'll uphold you. Surely I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. Be not anxious, for I am your God. There's one. Or Philippians. I am convinced that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion, that God will continue things. So there's a bunch of good verses. Well, I didn't know we were going to get a song out of the ending of our program <laughs> today. It. Thanks for being with us. We pray that God would be with you, granting you his richest blessings until we're together again next time. Thank you for watching the Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the gospel of Christ because of our generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org. Or write the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always.